Good morning. Let us pray. Lord, give us weak eyes for things which are of no account and clear eyes for all your truth. Amen. Our lesson for today is from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Listen to the word of the Lord. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord. For everyone, from least to the greatest, will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Isn't it great to hear from our young people the scripture readings? Another one of our confirmands. So proud of her. Thank you, Lauren. Our second reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel according to John. We're going to hear chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. So let us listen as Christ taught us to listen with ears to hear. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you know, Jason and I, along with our parents and our children, just a few days ago, consecrated our union as man and wife in a private chapel service in Seaside, Florida. It was over spring break. We took the kids. It was great. Before we left, we checked, of course, the 10-day forecast everyone does and discovered that rain was predicted. And, of course, of course, the forecast was for rain on the day of our service. Oh, well. Rain's supposed to be lucky on wedding days, right? We packed accordingly. But as things do, the forecast changed. And the day of our service, in fact, the entire trip, the weather was perfect. Not one drop of rain the entire trip, except one night. One night, while we were sleeping, without warning, came thunder that rattled the windows, every window in the house and every bone in the body. It woke us up from a dead sleep. Such is the voice of God. This voice is for your sake and not for mine, 
Jesus said. For your sake, he says. Let me suggest to you that for your sake should be the theme for all that is to come from now until Easter. All of what must transpire in Jesus' life, all of the suffering and betrayal, all of the doubt and the denials, all of the death and the mourning, and finally, yes, the victory and the proclamation, all of it is for your sake. This Sunday is the fifth Sunday in Lent, which means that next Sunday we'll celebrate Christ's entrance into Jerusalem with the waving of palms and the laying down of garments and the shouting of Hosanna in the highest. Our reading from John's Gospel today is actually a little bit out of order, or perhaps our Lenten calendar is, because according to John, this thunderous voice scene happens after what we call Palm Sunday, and yet we read it before. Why? Well, let me suggest that we read it before Palm Sunday because Jesus, in all of his godness, is experiencing past, present, and future in the moment. God exists, of course, outside of linear time. Emmanuel, in his humanity, knows the sequence of events that will follow. But in his divinity, he sees the timeless context of it all. That moment and the way that John records it looks back to the prophets, to Isaiah's suffering servant, to Jeremiah's new covenant. At the same time, it receives the present, the Gentiles, the Gentiles, the people that weren't allowed to, were asking to see Jesus. An alternate translation, by the way, is to believe in Jesus. It also sees the future crucifixion and resurrection, the victory over the powers of darkness, all in one moment. The voice of God is heard by the crowd as thunder and by Jesus as assurance. It's for the sake of Jesus' followers. It's our task, then, to listen to the thunder as we walk with Jesus through the final days and hours of his earthly life. Listening to the thunder is not an easy thing to do. Trusting that Jesus is God with us, and that he came to suffer and to die for the sins of the entire world, and that he was raised from the dead three days later and lives still today. Don't take it from me. Take it from God. Listen to the thunder. The thunder is for your sake. Thunder, according to the Library of Congress, I did a little research. I do these rabbit hole research things. Thunder is a sound that's caused by the rapid expansion of the air. Expansion of the air surrounding the path of a lightning bolt. My friends, lightning comes from the sky, connects to something on the ground, and returns on the very same path back to the sky. The air surrounding that path is superheated, superheated to 48,682 degrees or close to that Fahrenheit in the process of this lightning. Now, the ancients didn't know any of that, but we do. God's way is the way of expansion. The creator God who makes heaven and earth is still expanding the universe. We know that. At a rate scientists can really only hypothesize. Supercharged energy. Think, supercharged energy that travels from the sky to the earth and back again and causes expansive shock waves of news that we can hear. I mean, that sounds a lot like Jesus to me. Thunder also gives us a fair warning, doesn't it, of a gathering storm. The voice of God in today's passage certainly does that. 
The storm of Christ's passion is gathering, and God's will is being accomplished in it, and Jesus knows that the time to glorify God's name has arrived. He knows all of this in an instant. When? When the Gentiles ask to see him. God's kingdom is for everyone. It's even for groups of people who used to be excluded and even despised. Hear me again. God's kingdom is for everyone, even for groups of people who used to be excluded and despised. It was true then. It's true now. Listen to the thunder. Storms are still gathering, and the glorification of God's name is still happening. When people come to Jesus, who used to be excluded and despised by those who follow him, God's way and God's thunderous voice is expansion. The Gentiles in our passage today, scriptures tell us, they're there in Jerusalem at the festival, worshiping. Worshiping the God of Israel. They're what the ancients would have called God-fearers, people not born into the faith. We would call them converts. They want to see, they want to visit with, and they maybe want to believe in Jesus. So they approach Philip. Well, Philip, Philip is one of Jesus' followers who has a Greek name. Something familiar, a little something familiar in Philip. He probably speaks Greek because we know that he is from a predominantly Gentile region of the world. Philip was there in. He was an outsider who was also an insider. It causes me to pause and ponder. Who might be out there in our community right now feeling like an outsider, wanting to meet Jesus, looking at our congregation for someone they have enough in common with to be introduced. We need outsider insiders, don't we? They have a supremely important role to play in the growth and the expansion of God's kingdom right now. Outsider insiders are the in for the out people who know God, but want to meet Jesus. We must open our doors, our arms, our hearts to those on the outside. It's our work, it's our call, it's our purpose as God's people and as Christ's servants to follow, to be with, and to serve Jesus and those he loves. He loves everyone. He came to offer his life in exchange for everyone else's. It's time for the out to come in. This expanding universal knowledge of God is what Jeremiah is describing in this Old Testament reading, this new covenant. Jesus is the new covenant. All people can see, visit, and believe in Christ because it is God's glorious will to write the love of God and neighbor. That's the law, right? Writing the law means writing the love of God and neighbor on hearts instead of on stones. Love strong enough to bear the cross. Consider bearing the cross wide enough to include all people and gracious enough to forget. The scripture says he forgets all of the wrong that we do. Watch the news. That's a lot of forgetting. Such love is supercharged energy from heaven that connects here on earth in a flash and returns from whence it came and causes expansive shock waves of news that wake us up from what lulls us to sleep. Holy Week, Holy Week, 
is designed to wake us from our slumber. Sometimes we sleep through all of the gruesome details of Christ's passion. We do, because staying awake ironically means reliving a nightmare. The nightmare of an innocent man suffering because of our offenses. It's not fun, but it's for your sake. I have a suggestion for your devotional life these next two weeks. Spend some time meditating on the Nicene Creed. We say it in the Christmas season. It's a beautiful thing to meditate on now. Hear the expansion shockwaves in maker of heaven and earth, all things seen and unseen. Our expanding universe, our expanding kingdom of God. Consider how lightning strikes when you read and recite the words, God from God, light from light. Spend some time in the phrase, for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. Let the words, for our sake he was crucified. Let these things wake you from whatever lulls you to sleep. Because the gathering storm of Christ's impending passion, the shock waves of rattling thunder signaling Christ's coming from heaven and returning, the voice of God assuring us that all is his glory. It is for your sake. It is for the Gentiles' sake, for the followers' sake, for the outsider's sake, for the undesirable's sake, for your sake, for mine. The time has come, my friends, for Jesus to die. Our journey with Christ, from joyful hosannas to mournful denials, begins now. Holy Week approaches. It's a gathering storm. Listen to the thunder. Jesus knows the time has come for the new covenant to be fulfilled because Gentiles have come and asked to see him and to believe in him. When Jesus gives his consent, it sounds like this. Father, glorify your name. The thunderous assurance from heaven is that God will glorify God's powerful name again as it happened just days before at Lazarus' tomb. God resurrects Jesus, and the kingdom of God expands, and the world is changed forever. For your sake. Amen.